Oh, hey. Co-host Sean here with I'd Buy That for a Dollar. We're still on break gearing up for season six, but in the meantime, I'd like to present another Rewind episode. We're going all the way back to season one for Herbie Man, Memphis Underground. Herbie has come up many times on the podcast since this episode, so it's a great place to start for folks just getting started with the podcast. If we were to make a Mount Rushmore of I'd Buy That Artist, Herbie would be up there without question. I've continued to collect more of his discography and am continually amazed at how many slept on classics he's got. If you enjoy this episode and want more, check out Impressions of the Middle East, The Wailing Dervishes, Fire Island, Stone Flute, and First Light by the group The Family of Man. All are excellent and still very cheap. I hope you enjoy this early classic trio episode, and we'll be back with season six on October 1st. By the way, apologies in advance for the uh, vulgar cold open. Someone made an app that was designed to uh, accurately measure dick size, and they called it the Chubby Checker. <laughs> and Chubby Checker fucking sued them and won. <laughs> Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I am your number one host, Sean Hartman, joined by my regular number two and number three co-hosts, classically trained public fornicator, Jeremy Ruggles. I'm number two. And of course, senior curator for the now That's What I Call Music series, Peter Cook. I'm number three. It's been like a month or more since we've actually recorded these episodes. I know like out there in the rest of the world, these are coming once a week, but that's not how we do things. I was with you, Jeremy. Oh, right. (laughs) Traveling the whole world. Maybe you followed our Instagram, saw some of those updates of me and Jeremy looking a little haggard, maybe a little dirty out there digging, digging record bins all over this great country. Why didn't we bring Peter? I was in Hawaii. Oh, right. Yeah. I did discover some music while I was there, although I didn't get to go in any record stores, so I've been, but I kept a list, so eventually some of those will be on the show. Sick. Mm-hmm. Jeremy, well, did you find any good records on this tour you did with me? I don't know yet. For those who don't know, we're in my living room right now, and I'm pointing, and there's a big old stack of records that I picked up on this tour, and I've listened to two so far. Okay. Uh <laughs> Don't know if they've made the cut yet. Uh, they were both sick, but mostly haven't gotten through the very large pile of records there. What was your top three record spots you went to, Sean? Top three record spots? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a long episode. <laughs> Not even started on the real section of this episode yet. Well, we went to the Human Head Records in Brooklyn. That's been a favorite of mine for a while. I only bought one record there, though. I was feeling very broke by the time we got there. I was trying to be trying to be easy. This was like the fourth day on a 20-day tour, mind you. And like the 30th broke. record store yeah. in four days, yeah. I did get the Dwight Sykes reissue at Human Head Records, though. Kalamazoo guy booked a show for him here in town never actually bought the record until I went to New York I got a bunch of cool stuff at another Brooklyn store called Northern Lights that's where I got some good dub 45s and a Miracles record and a couple good soul 45s as well those are probably two of my favorite spots got some good stuff at Philadelphia Record Exchange as well that's another one of my favorites and the one in St. Louis you liked that one for yeah the last day of tour, I got some really good scores at a St. Louis store. That's all stuff I'm flipping, though. That Bought it cheap, cool store, selling though. it for more money. That was a really cool store. I like that place a lot. That's Are you even going to say their name? No free advertising It's, it's for one them? of those like super generic names. I'm constantly forgetting what it actually is. Do you remember what the name of it is? It was like Record Exchange 
store or something, right? Yeah, the <laughs> it's, it, has, it has the word record in it. Yeah. It's in St. Louis. It's real big. It's real crowded. It's the real big crowded one in with, St. Louis. With the word record in the name. <laughs> record and maybe exchange, maybe expo. <laughs> yeah, I was going to suggest es- expo. <laughs> it's like an EX in there somewhere. Yeah. The extravagant record in St. Louis. It might be extravagant records. I, we couldn't yeah. possibly look this up on the internet. It's better to for us to conjecture what so it might be. what you bring today, Sean? <laughs> we brought the... Oh, my God. Peter just cooked, kicked the microphone stand. I cooked the microphone. <laughs> Peter cooked the really microphone. cooked this Don't one up, Peter. Peter cooked these stands, bro. I had to do it early so I wouldn't do it again. Yeah. Have you opened all your drinks? Are we ready to actually do this podcast now? I am ready. <laughs> Are you? No. Okay. That's all right. We could talk more about record stores. So I brought with me one of my favorite records to put on for people just to kind of surprise them. It's got some real interesting left turns. Some people are familiar with the artist, but maybe don't know this section of his catalog that is more interesting than people would ever assume from a casual knowledge of this artist, which is Herbie Mann, Mr. Jazz Flute himself. You may know him from his many shirtless pictures and album covers where he's just looking like he thinks he's the sexiest motherfucker on God's green earth. I have a mandatory copy of Push Push in my collection. I have the public fornicator edition of that. Nice. That Jeremy Ruggles oversaw. (laughs) Oh, Lord. I have have an extra special one-of-a-kind bedazzled version of Push Push at home that I'll never get rid of. Is that for real? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you bedazzle it? No. No. A friend of mine was bedazzling records for the the store for a while. Okay. That was just a weird little project we had a long time ago where we were like bedazzling goofy dollar bin records and then marking them up a few bucks. (laughs) And I kept the Herbie Man because obviously you got to. Fair enough. So... People know Herbie Mann for his goofy album covers, for just being a jazz flutist, flautist. There's the Anchorman scene that's obviously a reference to Herbie Mann. Because from what I was reading, Herbie Mann was actually a like the originator of jazz flute. Not necessarily the first one, but really like the first guy to super popularize it and be like, no, this is this is my main instrument. Other people would dabble in some jazz flute, and Paul Horn was obviously another champion of the jazz flute but herbie man took it to a whole other level we're gonna do his album uh, memphis underground which came out in 1968 let's go ahead and just listen to the first track before we talk too much more about it track one is called memphis underground it's technically the only original song on the album there's one other that's a reworking of a standard which kind of counts as original but here we go memphis underground on the album of the same name First impressions, Jeremy Peter, what do you think of that track? I dig it. I remain slightly unconvinced. Mm-hmm. I'm coming into this from a perspective of not really knowing who Herbie Mann was. Sure. I dodged his shirtless photos, I suppose, and <laughs> 
fully avoid pretty much anything with Will Ferrell in it. So fair. That was pleasant, but it didn't grab me. Well, you have to try harder, Jeremy. I think you'll find that this is kind of starting out pretty light. Things are going to get a little more intense and involved as we go along here. I, that's almost like the elevator version of Herbie Man, right? The elevator music version. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to start off by correcting something I said before. This is album actually came out in '69, not '68. I mean, I'm. It might have been recorded partially in '68, but I told him not to correct it during the break. I just want to be on record for that. <laughs> our, our legions of fans would have corrected me either way, so I'm just jumping jumping out ahead of it. I like when they pile on you, though. <laughs> I love. I savor that moment when eight notifications come through on the social media, and I'm like, I hope this is on Sean. <laughs> I know it's not on Peter. He's got his facts straight. True. We've tested him every time. He's done his research. Yeah, and I don't even talk facts ever <laughs> just the opinions with this guy it's <laughs> just hallucinations <laughs> just <laughs> what is this album so Who is this guy you had mentioned during the break that you were kind of expecting more of a jazz sound but it's got yeah. instead a more straightforward four four kind of rock r&b type feel to uh, it yeah that's definitely one of the impressions that i had while listening to this in preview for the episode yeah this is an intentional jazz fusion idea that Herbie Mann had. He wanted to bring some of like the hottest up and coming New York jazz guys, take him down to Memphis and pair him with some of the studio musicians that were cranking out these hot Southern soul albums of the time. So this is 1969. This is two years after Otis Redding passed away. Motown was already huge, but what's been happening for the last few years is Memphis in particular has been defining this alternate Southern soul sound that's a little more rootsy, a little more blues based, a little slower tempo. You got artists like Aretha Franklin that are getting huge, Sam and Dave, Otis Redding, like we said, you know, Booker T and the MGs are becoming like the hottest house band in the world. And Herbie Mann wanted to see what he could do if he could kind of bring some more of that jazz influence into what was going on and just see what happens. Get that stack sound. Totally. So they went to a place called American Sound Studios in Memphis. He later did some stuff at Muscle Shoals. Uh, there's some stacks collaboration in his catalog, but this was American Sound Studios, which lasted for about eight years in Memphis. And their house band was a group that had dubbed themselves the Memphis Boys. Um, <laughs> And I did a little bit of research on the house members that played with them. You got Bobby Emmons on organ, who was a former member of Bill Black's Combo, which, Peter, you know a little bit about Bill Black's Combo, Yeah, he right? was Elvis's bassist. Yep. And then went solo and did a lot of instrumental R&B tracks, plus a lot of studio work. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, definitely. He was also a very frequent Willie Nelson collaborator later on. He's on like six or seven Willie albums in a row and did a lot of road work with them as well later on. So he's on Team Memphis. Oh, definitely. Yeah, these are all the Memphis dudes. One of three guitar players on this record, Reggie Young, was also the house band guy. And he later on played on a super influential record called Honky Tonk Heroes. Which I know, Peter, you're into that record. Jeremy, you hip to that album? No. Waylon Jennings, Honky Tonk Heroes. Uh, yeah, some, like have called it, some have called it the greatest outlaw country record of all time. It is. Oh, it's worth picking up. Yeah pretty legendary classic um, it, uh, i'd buy that for a dollar record unfortunately or no you like the <laughs> it might have been at one time yeah but now like a beat up reissue is still like 20 bucks minimum oh lord yeah it's a tough one to track down the house rhythm section the drums and bass you got gene chrisman on drums who is notable for having played on over 120 hit songs during his career and hundreds of albums and singles aside from that and then on bass, you got Mike Leach. Now, when I was listening to this album last week, kind of refreshing myself with it, there's a couple key players that I'll get to later that are the New York jazz guys that I was already familiar with, and that's why I picked up this record years ago in the first place. But I was noticing, on top of that, the drums and bass especially were just really good on this record. And some of the later tracks, they start locking in pretty hard on some grooves. I didn't recognize the names. I was like... I feel like I've got to know something these guys have been a part of looked it up it's Aretha Franklin's rhythm section <laughs> like 
they were part of the Memphis Boys, did a lot of Memphis studio work, but also are on a bunch of Aretha records and were her road band. Of course, they're going to be just the tastiest rhythms. I don't think you can work for Aretha Franklin if you're not completely on top of your game as far <laughs> as that funk rhythm goes. Yeah, she wasn't notoriously like a uh, James Brown style dictator, was she? She just was able to get the best names because she was Aretha Franklin. From the little bit of like research and interviews I've seen with her, she seemed... Like she was very good at collaborating with her musicians and allowing them to have as much input as possible. Okay. From like some of the studio stuff I've I've seen her talk about. Yeah, so she, she's proof that you don't have to drill and find your musicians to have like the hottest band in town. <laughs> there's yeah, there's a lot of different ways to come about it. <laughs> It'd be uh, cooler if you do though. <laughs> <laughs> it makes for better episodes of that Mike Judge uh program what's that called tales from the tour bus the tales from yeah, the yeah. tour bus <laughs> i also did a little research on what other records american studios and the memphis boys had done and the first one that popped out is another record from 1969 dusty in memphis by dusty springfield excellent record yeah yep. yeah amazing album so th- these are albums are just a few months apart as far as being recorded so it's the same backing lineup same energy same studio and then The year before, in 68, they were all on King Curtis's Sweet Soul, which is another really good album to check out. And then Bobby Womack was also a member of the studio for a while, was like a house musician, house songwriter, and did his debut album Fly Me to the Moon in 68, and all the Memphis Boys were the backing band on that as well, which helped launch Bobby Womack's career. Let's go ahead and listen to another track. Let's just play track two. It's called New Orleans. This is a Gary U.S. Bonds cover and (laughs) probably the funkiest track on the album. Jeremy, are you getting sold yet on this? What's the opinion? That was groovy. Funky, right? I was feeling that a little. Peter? I have a funny association when I hear flutes in this kind of context. One of the earliest examples I can remember is on the chronic at the end of side one. There's Little Ghetto Boy, which is based around a Donny Hathaway song. Mm. And there's an extended flute solo on it, which is incredible. It's also probably one of the tracks that's aged better on the chronic. (laughs) But it's, that's, you know, one of the first impressions I had of flute being used in kind of a more pop. That's a kind of a more soulful track, too. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with that particular track. I mean, I've, I've listened to the Gronach a fair amount, but I can't think of what that one in particular sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I'm not going to try to sing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. 
I've hinted that there's some fairly famous New York jazz musicians on this record, so let's go ahead and talk about those boys. A lot of people don't realize that these guys were all in this band at the same time because it's kind of incredible that all three of them were in the same boat. On guitar, you got Larry Coryell, who is one of like the absolute greatest fusion jazz guitarists of all time. He's done a million recordings. Mm -hmm. Dude just shreds so hard. He's guested on a lot of other people's records. He's done a bunch of really cool stuff as a band leader. And he was only about two years into his recording career on this. He started getting a few notable associations. He was kind of hot in the up and coming New York jazz scene, but was not an international superstar yet. And then next to him, you got the one and only Roy Ayers on Vibes, possibly the greatest jazz funk musician of all time, one of the most sampled artists in hip hop history. And same thing. I mean, he started recording in 62. He had just dropped the album Stone Soul Picnic in 68. He'd had a few kind of notable things. His famous album Ubiquity didn't come out till the next year. So he was just right before he became one of the most in-demand, hottest musicians. And then the real sleeper on this album, motherfucking Sonny Chirac, <laughs> is all over this record. Is he really? My vote for the greatest guitar player of all time, hands down. Very notable free jazz musician. A lot of people actually only know his work for doing the Space soundtrack Ghost. to Space Ghost Coast to Coast. <laughs> He's one of those guys you're not going to really know if you don't dig into free jazz guitar a bunch, but people that are into free jazz all kind of revere him as one of the greatest musicians ever. I don't know if I assume we're going to get to some of the tracks that he's more prominent on. Yeah. But there's some far out guitar sounds that feel perhaps ahead of their time. Totally. There is some kind of noisy elements in, in rock happening, but Mm -hmm. not, associated with Herbie Mann, I assume. Yeah, or, or really even a lot of... Easy. One of the other notable things with Sonny is he was experimenting with feedback solos before Hendrix was. A lot of the stuff... I mean, it's still noisy and weird for today, but in 68, there wasn't a lot of stuff people had heard, especially not on records that sold as well as this. So I'm sure the solo we're about to play off this next song really probably blew some heads. I suppose uh, as far as noisiness goes on records... Uh... You had the Beatles with uh, Revolution 9 going on, which is a different thing. That's mm-hmm. like music concrete or however you say that. Right. <laughs> it's right around the same time as this. But yeah, there, I was listening to this today and I had, you know, I listened to a lot of music that's kind of on this level, but I, I was driving to work and forgot what I was listening to and then said, wait, this is a Herbie Mann album from like 1969. Yeah. <laughs> Still, right? I'm still listening to that. <laughs> yeah, I am. I just love... So let's go ahead and stop talking about it and just play the track. So there's... This is the longest track on the album, track three, Hold On, I'm Coming, Sam and Dave cover. Pretty much everybody gets a solo. Uh, Larry Coryell gets the first guitar solo. Roy Ayers gets a solo. Herbie Mann's on it. And then let's go ahead and skip towards the back half of the track where they let Sonny just totally open up. <laughs>
when listening to that, I was reminded of the latest U.S. Girls album in a poem, Unlimited. The final track on that time has an extended vamp jam section where the guitarists go off into similar territory there. And, you know, that's what, 50 years later. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, uh, you know, that album is, you know, still kind of cutting edge. Uh, the the U.S. Girls album, yet here we are 50 years earlier with uh, it happening on this Herbie Mann record. <laughs> yeah, and who knows what kind of waves this album made as far as influencing future generations of experimental artists. Like we talked about, this was one of the best-selling jazz albums of its day, and a lot of people were buying this who were more familiar with Herbie's more straightforward stuff. So you got to imagine a lot of those people probably heard that sunny solo and hated it and probably skipped over that track the rest of the time they own the record but there had to be some people that heard that and were just like there's something else out there like i can't get this out of my head it's got to have influenced some people in that way if they he reaches one in ten people the aspiring musicians with that made a difference <laughs> maybe even one in 50 <laughs> it's it's pretty cool i imagine that is a reflection of the rising tides of weirdness of the late 60s psychedelia eking into popular square territory through Herbie Mann. There's one very famous person who was a big fan of this record. Hunter S. Thompson loved Hunter this S. album. Thompson. Yeah. Tell the listeners who that is in case they don't know. He's the guy that wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and bunch of other weird gonzo stuff wasn't he a writer for rolling stone yes or one of those magazines yeah yeah he wrote for like a bunch of magazines though rolling stone was probably the most notable and mm-hmm. regular one though wrote hell's angels hunter s thompson also ran for office at one point and did not win but during the campaign he used the final track in this album battle hymn of the republic in his i think speeches and advertisements beautiful i still haven't gone through my hunter s thompson phase <laughs> You might have missed it. Yeah, if it hasn't happened for you yet, you <laughs> might as well just move on. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting. <laughs> I want to get just a little bit into the background on Herbie Mann. He'd been a band leader since 1954. Like I said, he was an early pioneer of the jazz flute, and he's also very notable for mixing jazz with a lot of other styles. This is not the first album where he tried some kind of fusion style. He'd done records that were Afro-Cuban based before this. He'd done Brazilian records. He actually traveled to Brazil to do a handful of Bossa Nova collaboration albums. He has done Latin albums. He's done reggae stuff. And then on top of the, you know, soul and funk sound that he's doing here, he did more in this vein afterwards that also got a little bit more into the country roots and what was going on. Really interesting artist who's got 100 plus albums (laughs) that he's on, and most of them are really cheap. If you like this, there's a lot more that you can dig into. And there's really not a bad Herbie Mann record. They kind of go from good to great as far as I'm concerned. Despite what the covers may lead you to believe. I haven't I haven't actually seen the cover of this one yet, Sean. Is it as... Uh, it's right there. Oh, there it is there right it there. Is. It's a oh, cool it's, album cover, I'm I think. I'm holding up the cover. Yeah. Would you I like to describe was... this album cover to us, Peter? Well, it's a mostly black background with Herbie Mann's face... I'm trying to figure out how that's rendered. It's not, <laughs> it's, it almost looks like he's underwater. There's blue re- lettering, Herbie Man, Memphis Underground on the Atlantic label. Great font. Great font. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what to call that, but yeah, this is a much more appealing album cover than Push Push. Well, depending on what you're into. <laughs> I will also, since I'm holding it up facing Peter, I'm looking at the back of it. And I'm going to use this moment to correct Sean, who claimed Hold On, I'm Coming was the longest track on the album, when in fact, by time, it appears Chain of Fools is the longest track of the album. Oh, shit. Did it come out in 69? What does the date say on the back of this? Um, Back then, they often didn't put the years on records. 1969. Hell yeah. Right. (laughs) We don't have to start the episode over. Do we want to just go ahead and play a little bit of that Let's actual longest track the on the album? The actual longest then? track, Chain it's a, of Fools. It's a really good song. I think it's got probably the deepest groove on there, which, as we said, the rhythm section was very familiar with this song, and they play the hell out of it on this version. Also, there's one very long guitar solo on it that I'm 90% sure is Sonny Chirac. He doesn't go as far out as on a whole album coming, but it's kind of a masterpiece of a solo. 
He digs in real hard and I'm super into it. So let's hear some of that. I'm guessing that you are 100% on board with this record now, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm on board with it. Okay. It, it was the guitar that got me. I'm, I have a bias against flutes, I'm not going to lie. That's fair. It's one of those instruments that I feel like along with banjo, I hear people express phobia toward it often. I love banjo. Yeah. I don't know if I have an instrument that I hear and I cringe. I, I, haven't, I don't know that. It, some people say that about the saxophone. Are you a big bagpipe fan? Well, I'm a huge corn fan, so yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe bagpipe. Well, did House of Pain use bagpipes? Maybe. I don't know. It's, it <laughs> seems like something that DJ Muggs would have done. He was all about those bizarre samples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I don't seek out bagpipes. But okay. I'm, you know, <laughs> they are. they can be cool in the right context. All right. How about you, Sean? Do you harpsichord. Have any he doesn't like the harpsichord. The harpsichord is pretty cheesy most of the time. I see. I love the Kinks, and they use that a lot. So yeah, in the right again, in the right context, it's totally fine. You need to take a Marxian view and consider it in the uh, context of its surroundings and its time. You know. Okay. Cool. Cool. <laughs> I'll get right on that. Let's talk a little bit about more of the impact of this record and where it kind of sits in jazz history. This is a time period of jazz when most jazz artists were starting to experience some pretty heavy decline in their sales. The heyday of bop jazz was in the 50s. A lot of people still made it through the 60s really well, and you had the free jazz stuff starting to come around in the late 60s. But a lot of the old guard were just not making good records anymore, and the farther we went into the 70s, most of them really fell apart. Some of the only people that had good careers after that were the soul jazz crossover guys. And from what I understand, Herbie was making more money than just about anybody else in the jazz world through that time. And this record was key to that success. This was a huge hit for him. He just went back to the well on this. There's another record made shortly after called Memphis Two Step. That's the same formula. The album Push Push is, again, a lot of the same elements in here. Plus, he got Dwayne Allman on guitar with him in that record. He's done more stuff with Roy Ayers before and after this as well. And the formula was just working for him. He was actually crossing over to the pop charts for a while and scoring hit singles alongside other 70s folk and pop artists of the day. 
his legacy in a lot of ways has actually been tainted from that success. People think of him as a joke in the jazz world. He was the pop star who was making cheesy music that didn't matter because he was making money. And I, I really dislike that mentality of music. I think you can make money and have good art at the same time. And I think this record is proof of that. Having no concept of this Herbie man you speak of, I feel like I still don't understand who he is from a personality perspective. Mm -hmm. Can you enlighten me a little further there? Because if he was like a pop star, I assume he sought that out perhaps or leaned into it when it was happening for him. The only thing I get from Herbie Mann is that he was very sensual. Definitely. (laughs) That's the impression I get. He's definitely got some sensual vibes going on. I I feel like I can't fully answer that question. I haven't really watched any interviews with Herbie or even a lot of live footage, so I don't have a good feel for what kind of a person he was. All I know is the music that he made in the album covers and some of the promo shots that are in wide circulation. And you, yeah, you get that sensual vibe. You get that vibe that he knew he was making money and he knew why he was making money and he just rolled with that vibe as much as possible. I don't know how he was to work with or anything like that though. I've never heard any anecdotes about Miles Davis yelling at him or something. No. The one thing to his credit, I will say is he definitely could have told Sonny to re-record that song with a different solo. And not only did he not do that, but he put that song on the album. This is a already very successful guy who had no reason to take chances like that with his career, but he allowed it to happen. And then also in this same year, he, produced Sonny Chirac's first solo record, Black Woman, which is a highly experimental record. Herbie helped pay for it, and you know Sonny basically funded the recording of that with the money he was making from being Herbie's band. And Sonny was on like five other records with Herbie, man. So I think it speaks a lot to his credit as being kind of a visionary and also willing to take a lot of chances and try some experimental stuff and somehow still make it work financially. I think there's an untold story of the personal life of Herbie Mann lingering out there. Maybe another Herbie Mann record down the line. Oh, definitely. We have to bring to the table to to get the full backstory. I'd say so. One other thing is he started his own record label the following year in 1970 called Embryo Records. They were kind of short-lived. There's about 15 albums that came out. He self-released Push Push on there, a couple of other of his records, some stuff for some of his sidemen. But he also, again, did some very experimental stuff. He did a record for Tonto's Expanding Headband. Oh, wow. Yeah. Peter, you <laughs> want to tell us that. about that group a little bit? Yeah. I, you know, I, that's a band that, what is the, um, what's their record called? That they came out on that label. The album's called Zero Time Zero, from 1971. Okay, yeah, Zero Time. I can't even remember what's on that, but yeah, that's a pretty out there band. I can't say a whole lot about them. They were like early synthesizer pioneers, like very experimental synth heavy kind of tangerine dream vibes going on. So we're getting right towards the end of this. I just had some final thoughts and also a list of recommended albums. If you're into this, I found a quote from a reviewer named George Kanzier from 2004 reviewing Herbie's last record right before Herbie passed away. And he was kind of reflecting on Herbie's career and cultural impact. And I thought this quote was really interesting. He said, uh, man's career in both its questing nature and embrace of various music styles parallels that of Miles Davis. Man championed Brazilian music even before Stan Getz. When Miles was fusing jazz with rock, man was fusing with Memphis soul and Southern rock. He also was an early exponent of world music, but while Miles was usually hailed as a visionary, Mann was dismissed as just a popularizer selling out. It was a bum rap. I'd say I'd have to agree with that. That was kind of the the vibe I was starting to get just in doing the research, seeing those Brazilian records and thinking those were well before that was a fad that every other jazz artist was jumping on. His embrace of a wide range of musical styles, his willingness to bring these hot up and coming artists into his group instead of just relying on collaborating with other name artists. I think there's a lot going for his credit. Like you said, there's, there's probably a lot more interesting information we dug into is who was Herbie man as a person. Peter would have dug it up. (laughs) He would have been prepared. (laughs) I will. uh, When we do the next episode, I'll 
Peter gets the next Herbie Mann record. <laughs> Twenty-five page <laughs> research paper. Is he? What, when did you say Herbie Mann left the sphere? Did, or did you? Two thousand four. Two thousand four. Very long career. His first recording was in nineteen fifty-four. So literally a fifty-year career in music. Pretty good. If you like this record, I've got a, a short list of others to look into. There's a album that came out the year before called Windows Opened. That's a little bit more into the New York jazz sound. It's still got Roy Ayers and Sonny Chirac on it. That one has a more of a jazz feel. I think if anything, this album does suffer at times from being obviously not very rehearsed. It's two different groups of guys that have not played together before and are both kind of outside of their element. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it's a little bit stale, like on the opening track. I think Windows Opened has a better feel cohesively. And there's a following... Following year, 1970, he put on an album called Stone Flute that has some of the same players on it as well. That one's more subdued and introspective. I really like that record. And then Memphis Two Step came out in 1971. And I think that one actually fits together more because Herbie knew what he was doing by that point. Other musicians were familiar with the sound he was going for. And I think it's executed a little bit better. Memphis Underground just has that cool freak out solo on it and i think it's important for the sheer experimentation of it very cool well thank you for bringing that to us sean yeah oh the last quote man had uh, afterwards stated that this album and push push he thought were the epitome of a groove record and were his two proudest records from his catalog saying that specifically on memphis underground the rhythm section locked all in one perception is what he said that was kind of an interesting take on what a, a rhythm section should be trying to do. Very cool. So with that, let's go ahead and leave it on the final track. And this might actually make you a little bit more of a believer in the flute as an instrument. Cause I think it's a man's best performance on the record. This is his rendition of battle hymn of the Republic, which the normal version is a very stale kind of boring song. And he adds just a shocking amount of soul into his version of it. Vote for Hunter S. Thompson 2020. <laughs> we'll go out on that, and thank you for listening. This has been another installment of I'd Buy That for a Dollar. I'm Peter Cook. My name is Jeremy Ruggles. And I'm Sean Hartman. Thanks for listening. Wow, that was another great podcast. Where might you find more podcasts like that? You can find more podcasts like that at ibuythatpodcast.com. Specifically this podcast, not podcasts like it, like just other episodes of this podcast. It's called, just this one yeah. that we're doing, just different episodes. There are different episodes. Each episode's a different record. They're all good. The series is called I'd Buy That for a Dollar, and you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at facebook.com. It's I Buy That Podcast after the slash on Instagram or Facebook or Patreon if you're really into that. If you want to donate some money to us. If you would like to email us, you can email us at I Buy That Podcast at gmail.com and let us know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and what records you'd like to hear us talk about. Please like subscribe share tell your friends give us money and if you work at the guinness book of world records please put us in for the longest outro now thank you